So without any further ado, uh, please help me to welcome Sir Norman Rosenthal and Marina Bromvik. What a lot of light, Marina. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Good. So what a lot of light there is. I, can, you know, I, can, I can't see you out there, which is a pity, because one likes to see one's audience. I briefly glanced, and it looked like a very young audience, Marina. Can you see through there? Anyway, Marina, I think, needs absolutely no introduction for me. I mean, she's so famous, she's, been, she's become a kind of world star. When I saw her at uh, her famous thing at the Museum of Modern Art, I, Already three years ago, I mean, in 2010, I think it was. Is that right, Marina? 2010. She was wearing this wonderful red dress, and she reminded me completely of Maria Callas in Tosca, which I actually saw myself as a young man. She was totally Tosca, I thought, and it was very beautiful was so to watch tragic. her like that. And I gather, Marina, that you are quite interested in Maria Callas. Is she a kind of role model for you? You know what I like about Maria Callas is her dad. She died from broken heart. I mean, how romantic. I know. <laughs> how many people can die from broken heart these days? Not and so I, she many. Was, and she was only born a few blocks away from here, I believe, hmm? on, on Fifth true. Avenue. Actually, hmm? as a matter of fact, I'm planning a very big project uh, based on Maria Callas, but I never talked to anybody about that, how you figure out. I don't know. Well, I mean, Marina, you said you don't want to talk about the past, is what you told me. And I mean, Marina has rehearsed her past many times and in various forms, in films, and now, of course, in this wonderful opera, which I happened to see in Madrid twice last year, The Life and Death of Marina Abramovich, which is, I think, opening, was recently had its kind of North American premiere in Toronto and will be uh, at, the, uh, at the Armory, I think, towards the end of the year. Is that right? Hmm? 12th of December till not, 21st of December. But it's not the first time, Marina, that you have rehearsed your past. I mean, there are films and, as it were, this kind of opera of Bob Wilson. Yes, but always by other people, not by me, uh, yeah. which is completely different. If you give to other people to do your past, your past always look new to you because they always do differently than you will never do yourself. Anyway, we're not going to talk about the past, at least we're going to try not to talk about the past, and we're going to look at the future, and what Marina is going to do is uh, do a presentation of what she sees, at least as her immediate future, which I haven't seen, so I'm going to turn the chair around a little bit so I can see as well and try and ask some questions from there. Marina. Okay, let's do it. All right. Ah, so, after artists is present, my work in MoMA, I stand up out of this chair and I was not the same person anymore. I understood that for me it was very important kind of sense of urgency. There is no much time left and I have to have something like my legacy because the only thing you can leave behind you if you leave this life, it's a good idea. So for me it was really a good idea to create my institute, not my legacy like, like foundation, glorified your own work, but just like real institute which actually you can leave other arts and other, other types of work which is not mine. So let's go through this whole presentation next. So the first thing that I want to know, just a little bit of history, how this all institute you come into the, into the, into the function. Uh, I teach over the more than 25 years uh, in performance art, and I understood it was really important in the, in the teaching performance art to clean your house, but not the house outside of your body, but your house in your body. And I was just going to run through a few ideas that you see how I done this. Uh, with the students, mostly, you know, minimum between 12 to 25 at a time. So, this all, it's about concentration, it's about uh, perception, self-control, willpower, you know, the, uh, you know, really pushing mental and physical limits. And it's about how you to put yourself in the difficult circumstances to find out, you know, how you can deal with them. Okay, next. So. Uh, the people who come, you know, in the remote air area, it's very important that it's a too, uh, or too cold or too hot, but never comfortable, because as the Sufis say, the worst is the best. And uh, we will all sleep in the sleeping bags together, and we will wake up in the morning never 
in any kind of specific time. Sometimes four in the morning, sometimes six. It will be snow, mostly I like snow. And they will go naked and just jump and do different exercises, you know, in that kind of condition. Next, uh, they have to sign the contract with me that for five days there is no any kind of taking food and only would drink the water. Large quantity of water, herbal teas, no food at all. Next. Um, so the breathing exercise, we just go through these slides, so I just wanted to give you fast uh, the view. Uh, walking was very important. If you don't eat and you use really your energy to create the, these long distance walks, would take seven, eight hours in no any kind of important direction or no aim, and then coming back, just the walk as itself as, as exercise. Then this was done in Australia with the running fence exercise. Some, some exercises are very tough and very charging. Next. Uh, this will be like measuring the water in the in the stream. Next, uh, so the uh, very important exercise when you get all into this kind of situation, you get so angry. You get angry on me. You get angry on yourself. Why are you doing this and all the rest? Which is mind work this way. So this, to stop the anger is wonderful exercise. I, I can you know you can do it anytime you want in your own time. You know to be angry to repress anger is bad. Uh, to express anger is not good either. But how you deal with anger, you have to change the pattern of anger. To change the pattern of anger is very simple. You literally, uh, when you're really, really angry, just concentrate or breathe once deep with full lungs oxygen. You stop breathing and you don't breathe till you really get blue, till you really think, if I don't breathe air now, I'm just going to burst. And the moment you breathe this air, the enormous pleasure and satisfaction of breathing this air in, and having this air, the lungs full of your air, 90% anger is gone. It's no anger anymore. Okay. So then is the like slow motion exercises, all day going slow motion, or all uh, one day all all going very fast exercise, doing everything too fast or too slow, and to see the relation to time. Next. Uh, this is a nice exercise. We are talking Copenhagen, January, six in the morning you know, going to swim, not bad. Next, <laughs> uh, you know, touching, every energy, feeling the energy exercise, next. Um, the color exercise, very important, how the color create emotions and how color create a reaction on our nerve system. So I ask the participant to look one hour, uh, the red color, blue and yellow, three primary colors, and then write about reactions on, on, on that colors, next. So one exercise, you know, during the day, at the end of the day, how is it very important to actually understand this incredible thing falling from the wake, wake time to, mo to get going to sleep. Just that moment you awake, and next day, you, next moment you're sleeping, but you never remember that actually transition. So we are really learning to concentrate. And if you can create this transition from the wake state to the sleep, you actually can remember your dreams and become like reality. Okay, next. All right, public body. So this was about you know how to uh, how you can actually um, uh, prepare the artist for performance. Public body. For me, I understood that public is always somebody who is looking outside at something, but. The, and you know, they never really go through direct experience. So they create all these uh, elements and objects that actually put the public into the situation to experience themselves and to see what it does this to them. So I create this body of work called public body. Uh, I went to the Brazil and I sit in the mines and I just wait till the minerals tell me what to do. I wait for an idea. And that comes the idea. Next. So. Um, it's uh, objects for human use. I make the objects for human use and objects for non-human use. So next. So the object, this will be like now, this is in Japan, in, the, in Tokyo district. People go to you know, shop and they are tired and they will just go and press the body on the three crystal pillows, this rose quartz, head, heart, and sex, and get energy. Next. So when you see, you see the people, just, sometimes you see just people facing the wall. You don't even see the object. Next. That will be the family situation. So then I also deal with the three basic body positions, standing, sitting, lying. Okay, next. Next. And then, you know, I made, go back. I, I just made the shoes from Amethyst. When I told the, the, the workers that we're going to make shoes of Amethyst, they think I'm definitely crazy because, the, you know, they're 70 kilo, I don't know, 150 pounds. But the idea was not to walk in them. Idea was to stand in the position of the walk and create this mental departure in, with your mind, not your body. Next. 
So on the furniture, in the same way, next, we'll just go through. This I call crystal cinema, better than television. <laughs> next. And then I also create objects. This is done in Germany, never could be done in America. This is a normal person from the public taking his clothes off, going to these objects and creating this is soul operation table, which you actually, you're, you're curing your soul with the different colors could be adjusted. Next. So the public become actually the work. Next. Or that really smell good. This is like a 50 pounds or 60 pounds of chamomile, dry chamomile in the bus. And their public is request to stay three hours. They never want to leave. We have to get them out. <laughs> Next. And then I have some objects for human use and for non-human use because, you know, there is this other parallel reality that we don't even want to to learn and to see and to exist. So I made these objects for this, something that we don't see. Next. The little chairs for the, for the spirits with the water. Of course, you have to clean the spirits, so we clean them with the brush. Next. And these are made from crystals because the spirit can only be clean with crystals. Next. And all this experience, I'm going very fast, is come, you know, that I learn something out of all this and I create something called Abramovich Method. And this Abramovich method I exercised first time in Milano last year. I create objects, the public have to use them and inter in interact with them on the much longer scale. So this uh, proposition was two and a half hours. Next. So I would like to show you just the reasons why I do this. So can we put the light down? It's only one minute. I come from Orthodox background. My grandmother was always going to the church. As a child, I used to go with her. I was very impressed by the icons, especially Serbian, Greek, and Russian Orthodox icons. Then I heard all the stories about icons making miracles and creating an inner light. In icons, it is all about the internal journey of enlightenment. In a state of pure consciousness, you produce light and project it to the outside world. The light comes from inside. Okay, so this is the introduction with the Brahmach method that I understood actually then in a, in a moment of stillness and contemplation, there's something else is happening and you really get contact with your own consciousness yourself, which we normally don't do in real life. So I made these objects again for standing, sitting, and using. So we just go through them fast with the minerals. The headphones, people, next, please, just go next, next, next. The headphones that people uh, having is, stop, stop here, please. The headphones for people having on the ears is not to hear the music, is to stop any sound. So in complete silence. And uh, what is interesting here, the group of normal visitors are participating in this experiment, and other visitors are looking at them so it's actually artists is not there anymore necessary because we create kind of perpetual mobile situation that are the ones who observed become the public and the one who are public become observed and is continuously you know going into direct experience next which is interesting in this uh, project is that you are observed you are film you are photographed and you're in the gallery situation, and still you are actually much deeper with the contact with yourself because there's nowhere to escape. You Where have is to it, go. Marina? Huh? Where is this it? This was in Park in Milano last uh -huh. year. And so that's so next. Okay. So after all that, I decide now is the time to make institute. Let's really learn more. And uh, that's what I decide I, uh, to get the building in, um, in Hudson, in upstate New York. And I just show you fast what is this. Next. So the institute is there to preserve the legacy about performance and performance and, and other forms of immaterial art. Next. So what is immaterial art? Immaterial art is it's opera and, and, the, and the music and the dance and the theater and the uh, film and performance. And uh, for me, which is the next one, which is the most important is actually we are not talking here with this institute. We are not talking here anymore about um, 
performance itself, we are talking about culture in general. We are talking how we can uni unify culture together with art, with science, with new technology, and, uh, and um, the spirituality to create something like a new idea of Bauhaus, to create some new platform when really uh, different things can happen with the, in this kind of in the society. All right, so um, I really start first to study history of long durational artwork because for me, long durational artwork was the key why I got to this state of mind. And I understood in long durational artwork is not just the artist is going through the change, but also the public who is there with the artist. There is something uh, fundamentally changing in a consciousness when you see something which is long durational. So in history of long durational work, let's say we have to start with Wagner. I mean, in, in 19, 1800, he made his operas was 15 hours. He even gave instructions to the, to the, his, um, you know, the, the singers, what have to eat, what kind of the, the how much uh, the liquid they have to consume. They never leave the stage during this performance. Next. Uh, we, we have the Eric Satie in 1893. He make 850 times to perform this this uh, piece in successions. Next, uh, again Stockhausen, 29 hours or more. Next, one of the most extreme pieces is John Cage. This this piece was. Uh, made in, uh, in Germany and is uh, start performing 2001 and is going to, st to go, on, go back, go on for 639 years and we're going to finish in 2660 where all of us are very dead. <laughs> but that's How do really... You know? huh? How do you know? How, how what? About how I know? That, yeah, <laughs> that is the really serious age. Okay, <laughs> next. And then with Pina Bausch, who had a different world, world, you know, things three hours and more. Next, uh, you know, Douglas Gordon, who uh, actually slowed down the Hitchcock film Psycho, and uh, on 24 hours. So you go into dinner, and uh, you see just a knife in the shower. You've made the dinner. You stay with friends. You come back, and still the knife didn't go into the shower. So, <laughs> really long duration of video. Okay. The Christian Markley, very important, 20 hours piece. Next, uh, David Levin. It's interesting piece that he's the he's the German. Um, he, he actually um, asked uh, the actor in in Berlin, at the, who mostly plays Shakespeare, to go and uh, plant potatoes in the potato field outside of Berlin, and for one month the Shakespeare actor was actually planting potatoes and invite the public with the buses to come to see him in a, in a completely dislocation and quite interesting idea of possible new theater. Next. Uh, Te Ching, it's the artist who really made the longest performances ever. He made five performances. His performance was one year. This was one year sitting in his cell in the house created. Next. Or punching the clock every hour for one year. Or, next. The Terence Cole. Terence, are you here? Where is Terence? He must be here. <laughs> so he made this wonderful piece in the, the, in the gallery where he actually, this is sold, and he's with his niece going around and around during the, the, the time of the, of the gallery, which is seven hours a day, for five weeks. And sometimes he rests and, and then continue this pilgrimage around the salt. Next. So the Tino Segal. Okay, let's keep all the, let's keep all this. Uh, can we go to the to the Hudson itself? Okay, this is my piece. Is who cares? Go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mission Hudson, <laughs> because this is I want to go to the point. All right. So can, next, where it is? You see, it's two hours with the bus or the car, and it's between Dia Beacon, the Bart, the you know, the Williams College, the Mass Mocha, and Howard. So it's really kind of location, the center of upstate New York. It says that this is the building. Next. I went there with Rem Kohlhaas. Rem Kohlhaas, for me, it's a really important architect of, the, of this century. And I asked him to come and look at the building and propose to me the model with the ideas which I wanted to put in, how we can make master plan. Next. So the building was existing, that was built in 1929 as a theater, 
and uh, turn into the film theater later on, and then community tennis court. And then host can host 1,500 people normally seated. This is how Remco House starts. Okay, so this is how it's going to be if we have 20 million to build it, which we don't yet. <laughs> but is this the, we're going to take the, the, with the bus, the, you know, the participants from the station. It's just the school bus we painted white. <laughs> All right, this is what is going to happen. Completely glass construction opening, lights coming into the building. Okay, this is the back side. So, we have to be movement, collective mind, spirit, body, operational. Next. Uh, it's very simple. If you want to go into the building, you have to commit yourself that you stay there six hours. And you give the word of honor. If you don't stay six hours and you don't give the word of honor, you can't actually go in. You have to, be, you have to give to the institute the time in order to get experience. Otherwise, there is no deal. Okay? So, this is orientation hall. You have to put your watch, your camera, your uh, telephone, and everything in the locker for six hours. This is such a release to be out of your phone for six hours. This is one of the major I can, the, the, the thing to do <laughs> these days. And you get headphones to block the sound. Okay? First thing what you do, now you're free, and you have your own time, six hours, completely free, all by, just for yourself. You do the slow motion walk to, you know, slow down. Next. The first thing you do, you go to, to drinking water chamber. Drinking water chamber is a simple thing to do. You know, we can't live without water, but we forgot to drink water consciously and to have the time and space to do that. So here, you take the water and you drink in, you know, just in different way you've ever done before. Next, you have the crystal chamber. Next. You have the, so all these things you see before, there's going to be this. You have the chamber for the you know, for the human use, with the chairs. This is for the spirit use. The little chairs are for spirits. If you don't see them, that's your problem, but they're there. <laughs> then you have levitation, you have this uh, luminosity chamber with the, you know, lying on the, again, you know, in the lying position with the crystals. You have the magnet. This is magnets and change your energy field. Next. You have this one, you know, facing the wall. Next. Levitation one we try to do with the scientists that you actually calculate the, 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 um, the magnet field and that you can levitate and not feel gravitation at the same time. Next. The current chamber, this is all different story, how to deal with that and not go into it. Next. The sound chamber that we can actually hear the sound. Blood bank, very complicated. Very, it's a really almost science fiction. I'll, let you, I'll talk to you later. Science chamber, science chamber is a, it's something that I, you know, after the artist is present, the, the American and, and the Russian scientists got interest in me, and they start to experiment with my brain. And they find out that if you're looking into a total stranger without speaking one word before, that actually subconsciously, brain have enormous amount of function. And now we are experimenting and analyzing data. Can we see the just what's happening. This is on the right side is my brain and the left is the unknown person. And then after a very short time, the brain starts functioning and actually creating signals. So we will have scientific chambers that we will analyze different scientific phenomena. Then we have Tesla chamber because another scientist we want to Make What's a Tesla chamber? Tesla chamber is going to be for anybody who wanted to create Tesla, to recreate Tesla experiments or create something in, the, in, a, in homage to Tesla as a scientist. Next. And then you really went through the chambers. Now you're a little bit tired, but also you're ready to see the art or to see whatever is happening in the main hall. So you go to this prototype chair number one or you take the prototype chair number two and you roll, like on the wheelchair, into the main hall. And then you look things, and then you look into, you know, in different situations. There's one hall, go, just go fast. Next hall, next, next, next. And then you get tired and you fall asleep. Then you're bringing transport, you're transported to the, to the sleeping dock. And this is really important because the, the, your experience and your consumption of art never stop. Even in the sleep, you're there and you're secure and you're free from your phone. So you sleep. <laughs> then, then 
you wake up, so six hours is gone. You can go through the lecture, next, or you can go to the library, or you can go to see more things, or you go through the whole process again. You get your certificate and you leave. And now in Illuminato, we made a prototype, which is literally a little tent, who can travel and is only two hours experience and is only seven chambers. And now we're going to put on the truck and travel around so that prototype will be some kind of fundraising, also the possibility, but also the people to understand and could experience on two hours what they can experience on six in these chambers. So that's all, more or less. Thank you. So, Marina, I've not seen this before, so it's, you know, I'm completely as fresh to this as everybody in the audience. And I suppose the first thing I want to ask you after seeing that, what is wrong in the world? What is most wrong in the world that you think we need to cure? I mean, this is obviously a kind of recipe, a kind of Monte Verita recipe for a new way of living, I suppose. So what is wrong in the world today, in your opinion? Before I answer this, can you explain to the audience what is La Monteverita? Because I had the La Monteverita very much in my mind. Can you explain a little bit to the them? Monteverita was this rather extraordinary place in Switzerland, in, uh, in, uh, in southern Switzerland, on one of those lakes, I think, in Lugano, I think, in Lugano, where, um, where as it were, a kind of anthroposophical kind of world was, kind of it was erected by various people and lots of kind of, as it were, intellectuals who were dreaming of a new world around about 1900 gravitated. People who were dissatisfied with the world, this is on the eve of the First World War, I think that's probably the best way of defining it, uh, and th these were people who were dissatisfied with the world, and amongst the people who went there, of course, was, was one, of the, one of the people who went there was, of course, Lenin himself. And, and Rudolf Steiner, of course. And, and many, many, as it were, intellectuals, writers, painters, artists, but also, as it were, idealistic politicians. And one can perhaps question where that kind of idealism in the year 1900 led to ultimately. So, I mean, that's what I want to really ask you. Where would this world lead to, this new Monte Verita lead to now? Because obviously the Monte Verita of then, which was immortalized in a very beautiful exhibition that was curated by Har Harry Zeman at the Kunsthaus in Zurich, around, I suppose, about 30 years ago, when we were quite young, because, I mean, you, you and me are roughly of the same age. I think you were born in 46, I was born in 44, when Hitler was still alive. Hmm? He was still alive when I was born. He was dead when, he was just dead when you were born. And... <laughs> I don't know what that means, and, uh, but I mean, one could say, what did Monte Verita lead to? Because one could argue that Monte Verita led to, obviously, the beautiful Russian Revolution and all the hopes that were engendered by the Russian Revolution, but of course, all the failure of hope that led, that, as it were, subsequently happened. First, to answer the question, what is wrong in this world today? Almost everything. I mean, excuse me. What is not wrong is much shorter list than what is wrong. It's so many things wrong. And you know, I'm so tired to listen of complaints of, of my generation, of our artists and, and people, you know, what is wrong and what, you know, is wrong on this part of the world and what's wrong in art, what is wrong in society, what is wrong in, about nature, about Earth, about planet. And I think that it's so important that see what every individual on his own can do to make things better. And I'm always for action. I want to do things. And yeah. I was thinking, if I take the Hudson, which is like a small town, who have the every single characteristic of the big town, in, in which I mean, poverty, re, rich and, 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 uh, and poor. Then, you know, crime, uh, racism, uh, you know, political struggle, political differences, uh, religion differences, everything the same like anywhere else, but in small scale. And if these people in Hudson would be my first visitors in this kind of institute, and by being there for six hours, or, or coming there more often, and see if, if they can make the change in their life, whatever they do in their own work, because this is not for artists, this is for everybody. And they, if they can, this experience can change something in their life and change the way of seeing our world and change the consciousness, we are creating prototype of society in a small scale, which can affect maybe somebody else. And let's start small. 
But do you think one of the things that I noticed right at the beginning of our presentation was the word anger. Now, do you think anger has informed everything you've done? I mean, from the beginning to now? Hunger, yes, but not anger. Anger. Not hunger. I'm hunger. I'm curious. I'm hunger for things. But anger, I'm not angry. But isn't a politi I mean, would you describe yourself as a political artist, whatever no, that means? No, I, I don't want to be in any category. I'm not political artist, I'm not a, a social artist, I'm not this, I'm not that. You know, the art have to have complexity and have many, many layers in the same time. Otherwise, it would be just one. If it's political, it's like old newspaper you read today and tomorrow is old. But I'm interested. And change. But if you so, compare yourself to someone like somebody, I think you identified yourself with it to, up to a point with Joseph Boyce. Would, who would have described himself but as a kind was of political so German. artist? Wait, he was so German. I'm so Slavic. It's a completely different story. <laughs> so can you describe the difference between the Slav, the German, and soon I might add to that the Jew? Hmm? <laughs> because oh that's where God. we are at the moment, you know, okay. in the, in the but, 92nd Street Y. Hmm? But you know how the Germans are. They're full of discipline and, you know, they are soldiers in the, in the, in the, in the nature. Slavic are chaotic. You know, they drink vodka all day long. They, they, they write poetry. They are, they are suicidal. They are a mess, you know. <laughs> and they, they, and they feed on suffering. And that's how Dostoevsky make what he made. Otherwise, he yeah, would never do it. But the Germans it. wrote poetry too. Yeah, but it's a different type of suffering. It's more for the, you know, the fatherland. This is all motherland. It's a different story. <laughs> I'm not quite sure it's quite as... I'm not quite sure it's as simple as that. Uh, uh, mm? I'm not quite sure the difference is as simple as that. Mm? Okay. But, uh, I mean, anger seems to me something that does inform your work, at but, least from right, my perspective. But I want to ask you questions. Okay, you come from this... You come through this British emperor, you've been everywhere, you conquer everything. So how you see the, this kind of idea of the, of the institute? Do you think that could have any kind of um, uh, possibility to develop in England, something like that, the type of the, you know, prototype of society yeah, to I, change? Yeah, I think it could be. I mean, you a have very this green forever, they never it change. It could be, I think, to do an institute of yours. I mean, it would have an effect in England too. But I mean, it would have had an effect in America, and it would have an effect in uh, in Montenegro, which is, I think, where you want also to set up a kind of institute, a kind of parallel institute. Is that correct? Yeah, but it's different. Is 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 a different. But uh, what is the difference then between the world, the Slavic world, and this kind of melting pot that is the United States of America? You know, I, it's it's it's. Uh, let's let's talk about your world and American world because there we are here now. You know, it, it, the. British have such a long tradition and they're old. This is young society here, it's different. They're much more, they're much more open to things than British ever been, I think. Yeah, but... Uh, you know, here is different, it's more flexible. You, you can really come with new ideas and you have this young people who really embrace. And, and they so what to kind see of energy, new. for example, resides in the crystals? I mean, what is so particular? Oh, that's all different stuff. What? That's another, well, that's another question. Hmm? Okay. Crystals. <laughs> Let's see the crystals. Talk about the crystals, which <laughs> seem suddenly towards the end of your presentation to play a very mm. large role, as though there is a kind of energy within these things, or is it something that we project onto them? Okay, before I, I, I do this, I would like to show you just a little trailer of Brazil. I went to Brazil for three months to study uh, the shamanism, incorporation of the spirits, and to study, I call places of power. The places who have the waterfalls, certain rock formations, the places who have um, the, the um, volcanoes, there is a kind of energy, and definitely energy in material, like a quartz, like a amethyst, like a, the rose quartz, like a crystals. Because, you know, crystals, like a, I find them like the oldest computers of the, our planet, because every impulse you put in crystal, including your watch, stays there forever. And is they really have a certain memory, and if you get into vibration in the same as a crystal, is a scientifically proved that actually you can get certain energy, which is very high healing proper property. So to do all that, I went to the to Brazil. I just show you a little trailer, and the film is going to come next year, so you have to wait, and it's going to call The Current. But I really went to see like a healers, like a people who do extraordinary work that you can't actually. Uh, 
explain rationally. The man who cured the cancer by cutting the bodies, and I, I hold instruments for him, and I had two cameras to film, you know, cutting the, 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 the breast, the stomach, the cleaning, the, the scrubbing the eyes with kitchen knives, and the people survive, and there's no explanation whatsoever how this is done. Crystals are one of these elements of healing too, so i just show you this three minutes for the part. Let's it's see the, it's let's just see trailer, no, not yet the movie. Who's the light? I came to Brazil to look for places of power. with the people who have certain energy. The ones who really learn how to take energy from outside. And from inside of themselves. Transform it and give it back to the ones who doesn't know to do that. Let's do this raspage. It's coming. Using the energy of entities, I can help raising consciousness through art. So what I would gather from that, Marina, is that it's something to do with participate, participating. That by actually participating to such a degree that you have total identification, that you somehow transform yourself. And is that what, is, is that what performance is all about in a certain kind of way? You know, for me, uh, I'm going to these all different cultures to learn where is the limit of the body, where is the limit of our, of the, of our mental states, and what, how incredible less we use our body in our Western society and how we don't know anything about anything and how we can heal ourselves, how we can change the energy, how we can do... S it's actually limitless power. And we, we are not able because technology just fucked us up so badly. So that... That's the thing, you know. So do you think there's another medicine, for this example? This is another medicine. And, you know, I... I took in me a deep sense, in a broad sense. It's a kind of medicine for existing. It took me 40 years to to come to this point that I understand profoundly the power of performance art, that actually you don't even need to do anything. It's all about energy, and energy is something which is invisible. You can't hang it like a painting on the wall. You have to feel it. And to feel it, you have to be exposed for it, to it. So do you think everybody potentially has the ability to enter these kinds of worlds? every human being, and this is why this institute is a platform to that kind of experience, that you can, you know, kind of merge science, spirituality, technology, and art together into the new idea of society. So when, uh, I, if I'm allowed to call him that, my friend Joseph Boyce, I come back to him once again, try to do his open university. Are you trying to do a kind of parallel thing? Obviously, he's an artist who's been dead for 20 years and more, are you trying to do something similar to him in our time, in that respect? I would like to do something more successful than him. More? Successful. <laughs> that, I really ch that I really do change. I really want to people to change. I don't want to just talk about, you know, he, he didn't succeed to change them. The idea is how to really do something that people can have experience, you see? Not just to be in a... In, in, to stay on the platform of art, to go much beyond art, but to go into culture. But he wanted to do that too, of course. Hmm? He believed he could do that as well through art. Now, you believe, presumably, you can also do that through art. Now, do you think that's a no, realistic idea No, he made a huge mistake. No, he made a huge mistake. He also went into politics, and that's the worst. Politics are dirty. And politics are never healthy for an artist to be involved. So in that sense, you're trying to kind of separate the human condition from politics, is that a possibility? Yeah, I think so. Because w I think that one moment when you really change your consciousness, you can 
deal with politics in a better way than what politics is today now. It's, it's now, it's, it's a shame what ha happened with politics. But you, have to, you can't do anything, you can't do anything, you can't move anywhere if you don't change your consciousness about things. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a base. But I mean, life in general is a, a learning experience, isn't it? So how do we learn from living and how do we make, do we want to make ourselves better? Or do, what do we want to do? What are you trying to achieve? I mean, how does the world change through what you're trying to do? Except as a kind of model in the way that Monte Verita did, Joseph Boyce did, and I dare say a number of other artists over you know, the last hundred years, particularly. I just want you to learn to drink water consciously. Let's start with that. <laughs> simple, simple ritualization of everyday life helps a lot. So every time I drink some water, I should somehow feel that I'm drinking water. No, 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 no. Can I tell you how to drink water right Please. now? Okay. All right. First of all, put you, you writing down. Take comfortable position on you and don't cross your legs and sit nicely. Okay. Hold water with the both hands. All right. Close your eyes. Forget everybody around. Then concentrate on intention that you're going to drink the water. Slowly put your lips on the brim of the, of the glass, but you don't drink. You just feel the coldness of the glass and just a little zip of the water. And then take it slowly and feel how this completely nourish every atom of your body. And how it's important is life. Without water, you can't live. Then put it again down. Just s close your eyes still, slowly. And if you drink in that manner, 10 minutes or more, this water, this water is not water anymore. It's the life force you're bringing into your body, which heals. Simple. Okay. Well, Marina, I've been quite ill recently, as you know. But you never talk to me. So uh, maybe <laughs> I should come and talk to you. Maybe you can heal me. Hmm? Better than can my doctors. Hmm? All right. Shall we? Shall we go into public questions? I think we should. Perhaps. I think that Already. Let's <laughs> see what what they can ask. I am dying to hear. I will throw in some questions on our route. But I think somebody's bringing me some questions. Is that right? Well, maybe I've got some here already. I don't but know. Can we put the light into public? I need to see them, yeah, I... please. I am in the darkness here. We are all in the darkness. Can we change the lights, please? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. I <laughs> said us. There are more to come. Can I get a chance to sort through these? Yeah. Trying to read this properly, huh? What made you choose Hudson for your art center? I love that town, and I see it getting better and better each year. You know, I arrived in New York 15 years ago, and after five years in New York, I was thinking I'm going to die if I don't go to somewhere and hug the tree or go to the green, you know, because, you know, the New York... It's it's really important place to live, but in the same time, is a hell. Is a sound pollution. Is information pollution. Is the, it's uh, you know air pollution. <laughs> every every possible way. So at the end of the week, you need to leave and to go away. So I found beautiful place in in, in Chatham and where I have the place to to stay in the weekends, and then I was looking for the an, the place in to create this uh, institute, and first of all, I look in Brooklyn, not in Hudson. And I found this in Bushwick, this great factory, which was really interesting to, to get. But then investigation of the land, it was so much pollution of the factory waste that actually extracting this it was, will cost three much times than the building. And I was thinking this is impossible. And plus, it's a good, it was a wrong decision. If you want to do this kind of place, institute with this kind of program, you should also go into a more peaceful situation than New York. And then when I saw this building, which was empty at the time, it was just uh, you know, the, the on sale, and it was like a dream come true. 
And uh, since then, you know, now it's, it's, it's a four years how I have this building, the Hudson been changed enormously. I mean, the, there is a new, new, new galleries, new shops, new artists coming. The, you know, the, it's, it's a just huge, huge uh, change and become really the town that I really wish to, to work with and make this institute, you know, reality. And how far is it from... Two hours. How far, no, how it's, far is it from the center of the town to... As you were the green is the, wilderness. Is the center of the town, and the green wilderness is just uh, you go three streets down, and you're in the in, and you see deers on the road. <laughs> it's beautiful. Sounds beautiful. absolutely wonderful. Now, one uh, somebody is writing a uh, asking a question here. One question. Uh, somebody who uh, seems to have interviewed you for Interview Magazine. One question I didn't ask, since it didn't seem relevant to the piece. What do you think about love? Love is the inspiration for so much art, but is marriage and romantic love even a possibility in this world today? In other words, do you have to, is it best to be on your own? Because you are, now you're on your own in a way. Do you, are you happy on your own or were you happy as what you call in your hermaphrodite state when you were with Ule? Ule was not the only man in my life. <laughs> there was <laughs> others. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, this was 24 years ago. I mean, you know, I had a life after. But, but let's, let's talk about love. You know, this four years ago, if you ask me this question, it was a very painful question. And, uh, you know, I, I love, I've been disappointed in love. You, you love again, you get disappointed again, you love again. You know, it's going on and on. And, and I was always connecting the happiness and love to somebody else, that you have to be happy if you're happy with somebody. And only the recently, now I think since last two years, that I am so profoundly happy because I understood that life comes from inside and doesn't relate to anything outside, that actually to be in peace with yourself and in peace with what you're doing is the is the really the most pure love. And then the rest that, that we all have to learn about unconditional love, because all our loves are conditional, and this is what is the biggest source of suffering. But unconditional love is really free, is about freedom. And I learned this in, in my, now, you know, so late. I mean, now, 67, you I wish you'd unconditional known, love. Would you like to have known this a long time ago? Uh, yeah, it would be so much less suffering. But you see, suffering is always good. I mean, no one artwork was made from happiness. Suffering is good stuff. You know, I always say the more uh, fucked up childhood you got, the better artist you get. <laughs> so I will not like to change anything. So when present, says another questioner, who's written this question on the internet, when present in front of an audience, at long enough spasms, do other means of complex communication manifest with different sensory perceptions, and how do you interact with it? I mean, are you aware of your audience all the time, or are you basically looking within yourself, is what I think the questioner is asking. This is Andrew Damas. Hmm? You know, it's a really interesting question because every artist will have a different answer to this. There's so many artists who really are not interesting in audience and not where audience. They create this kind of own inner world and they stay there. I, I don't know, I am incredibly interested in audience. For me, the audience, it's very, very important. The Martha Graham said, wherever dancer dance, there is a holy ground. And I can interpret a different way. I say, wherever, where everywhere audience stand is the holy ground for me. When I do the lecture or I talk to or I perform, I can feel a pulse of audience. I can feel if audience go to the bathroom and I'm waiting for them to come back. If they don't come back, I know something is very wrong. But I, but I need that kind, of, because you see performance, it doesn't exist by itself. Audience complete the work. Without audience, there is no performance. There is no sense. So this is why the audience is a very important to me. It's a really key element to complete the work and to make it all. I remember being with our friend Terence Coe once, and he was trying to do a performance deliberately without an audience. And then, as a kind of exception, he allowed me to come 
along and watch his performance. And so it was just a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, do you think it is possible to, you think it's absolutely impossible to do a performance without an audience? I, I, I had an example which I, with Ulai in 1977, we made war call relation in time, which we made a performance 16 hours without any audience except for the camera, you know, filming constantly. And when we got completely exhausted on the end of our energy, then audience arrived. And using the energy of the audience, we sit one more hour because we wanted to experiment to see if actually energy of audience can, you know, push our limits, physical limits, even farther. And that happened. But after this, I never done anything without audience. Another somebody is asking a question. As an artist and teacher, what do you feel you provide for the public and the students? Is the main objective to focus within, or to provoke an action, or to change the thought in the viewer? You mean as a teacher? Yeah, as a teacher. Are you also teaching yourself, is what is, is what? You know, teaching was very big part, an important part of, of my, my work, because many artists teach, you know, for the money, for existence, but I think for me it was part of the work, and, and to, you know, to, to, to teach, and to come in one point that you unconditionally give the knowledge to the younger generation of artists. And, uh, you know, the first thing that I will ask and, and the young artists coming to me, to be teached is if he know he's an artist, how he know he's an artist. This is the first thing, you know, because so many people like to come and say, oh, I like to be an artist to be famous and rich. They can leave immediately because this is not the reason why you're doing art. That is just side effect. Yeah, we'd if you agree get with rich that, or you're famous, sure. but not the reason. So then you have to really understand that inner need why you are an artist. And then to understand what type of art is good for you. It's not that everybody can be performance artist. I, I can really by now, if you if the young artist stand in the front of me and he can you know, do nothing, just standing there. I can tell with really, uh, completely the kind of uh, security if he is performance artist or he, or, he, or is not. Because it's not about the ideas you can learn, the, the, you know, you, how to do the work you can learn. There are lots of techniques you can learn. But what you can't learn is charisma. You are born with this or you don't have it and you can't do anything about it. And that's performance artists need to have this for the public. Otherwise, you can't do it. And you know, if you're a painter, you, you, you don't need. You, you put all your energy into the work, into the painting. Painting is the one who communicates to the public, not you. But if you are the object and the subject of the work, because you are the, the one who is there to, in the front of the public, then you have to have that. At a certain moment in your presentation, you were talking about the colors, about the primary colors. Now, what is the significance in the, in the context of painting? of the primary colors that you were talking about? Uh, no, it's just, uh, it's just it's so important, the combination, especially if we talk about abstract paintings, combination of certain colors and how that colors react on your nerve system and what response they have. I mean, you know, the, the Rothko knew everything about it. <laughs> so do you think a painting is like a crystal in a certain way? A Rothko is like a crystal? What yeah. is more, which is deeper, the crystal or the Rothko? <laughs> what is the first, the egg or the chicken? <laughs> No, no question, no answer to this question. Let's what go next. Were, uh, somebody's asking me here too, what, are the, what is the current chamber and the, what is the blood chamber, which you were referring to? I, so what I, do these two things mean? What, suppose, what, is, what happens when you go inside? Or is it different for every person? Presumably it's different for every person. Uh -huh. Now I have to reveal my secrets. Okay, the current. The current, uh, the energy current, I learned in Brazil with the shamans. So if you have a, you can create current of energy with a lots of people in one space, and you can feel this current of energy who can have, have actually have healing properties. So that's the one thing. Blood bank is something completely different. Uh, I scientifically is proved that if you take a drop of blood out of your body, that the, there is a connection between drop of blood, even if it's dry, is a life force between this drop of blood and you. So this is the way how the shamanism, the healing on distance works, because can, people can, they can heal you on distance because of that kind of, you know, the, the energy connection. But if, the, if, you, if you die, there is, no, there is no connection anymore. The life force is gone. So the blood bank is a kind of utopia idea for me. I was thinking, what if I take from 250 people, 
blood drop from the most important people of this century who had contributed to our society. You know, the best writers, the best the filmmakers, the, 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 scent, the, the scientists, the, the artists, you know, just the, the, the human beings who, who are really giving something to this society. And then we create this blood bank, and this blood bank in this special glass room who is always locked, but only once a year, the most important shaman, this is Utopia, comes and energizes these blood drops. And by giving this energy, extra energy, the people can be even more actually productive in their own field, whatever they do. So that's the idea of blood bank. And somebody else asked a very simple question here. I mean, it's insane, of course, but, <laughs> but <laughs> why not? Who, who, I'll come back to that question because it interests me and I'll have to kind of form it in my own mind. But who creates limits? Because limits is a very big thing in your art. I mean, how do you decide when to stop? You know, unfortunately, we create our own limits. We create our own cage. Everybody who have... The, you know, in our own life, we create our own misery. We create everything. It's amazing. And, and you can get liberated and get free like this if we want. And we don't. We, 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 we just kind of keep, you know, living in these limits. And it's just us. And it's so important to... This is why it's a very important notion to think about dying every day to think about our temporality. Because the only when you think that you can die any second of any moment in, in a day, you actually can make your life more meaningful. You can understand that there's so many times we, we just lose our time in complete unimportant things and focus on things that are important in our own life. And then, you know, then we, we will not see these limits anymore. We can really push them farther and farther. I think that there's a lots of things you can push in limits. I, I mean, you should not die by pushing limits, but you should see how far you can go. And human body and human mind can go very, very far. Even with pain? Even what? With pain. Of pain is, is, is amazing what human being can actually, you know, really injure. It's quite incredible. And what about this strange thing that you, sometimes I even have to look away myself, when you inflict yourself with, when you inflict pain on yourself, either through a kind of self-flagellation or through drawing blood from yourself. Yeah, but that's, that's so, you know, we are, we are so afraid of that. But in a way, you know, what I was trying to do in my early performances is to stage painful moments of life and show to the public that actually you, we have that energy to deal with them and to get rid of fear of pain. And, the, and if I can do it to me, they can do it in their own life. I'm the mirror, you see? And, the, and the, the, you know, the pain can be complete illusion. We, we can actually control pain, and we can get free of pain if we want. And people who survive terrifying illness, and even worse, who survive torture, which is happening all over the world today, everywhere, maybe even in, this, you know, in the United States, but certainly everywhere, torture is happening. Do you think people... Do you think somehow people can learn to cope with that or they find themselves able to cope with that? I, I had the experience with, I don't want to talk about politics and from where and what, with few people who really went to serious torture. And, uh, and, and you know, these people are incredibly happy people that, 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 that after that what happened to them, nothing worse can happen in their life. And they really take life as a, as a huge, huge presence, present. But it's possible, everything is possible. Do you regard life as a huge present? Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy. <laughs> life is good. Life is good with us or without us, anyway. The, que so the question <laughs> that is in front of me, from, I think, Arabella. First, you are such a strong influence, not only in art, but also as a strong woman and human being. You said happiness comes from the understanding of your own being. What is the most important thing you've learned about yourself through this journey that you've had now, as it were, for 60 years, for 40 years? For what, you know, you've been an artist for 40 years, you've been on this planet for 60 years or, or so. I mean, how would you answer that question? And she says, thank you. But I just answer, actually. <laughs> it's like, more I, or less, you know, I, I just did that. You know, it's a long journey. It takes so long, you know, to, to me, it, you know, I never could just sit in the in the MoMA uh, and the chair like that if I didn't go through the hell of learning it.
because it will never work. And when I was young, I needed so many material around me to protect myself from insecurity. And then when you really understand about energy, you don't need anything. You just need to be. And that's a really big, big, um, big journey. And, you know, it's, it was a good journey. But let's ask some more difficult questions, please. Something more well, edgy. Somebody's asking here, what do you think of art becoming about the experience economy? Do you think one day's museums will be like fun parks, roller coasters, experiences? I mean, are you worried about the materialization of culture? You know, it's so good when the economy goes down, when everything collapses, because then the pure art comes into life. When, when everything is great and the money is there, then art becomes commodity. And it's a very bad, bad point to be, to be the art as a commodity. Art really has to have function. Art has to have meaning. Art has to you know, have oxygen to society. And the, the true art is nothing to do with the, with the, with the money. You know? That's the big, big mistake. But so I think that, uh, that the less money we have, the better art we get. But you imagine a world where somehow we all, I mean, again, this is a very idealistic world that you perhaps envisage, where everybody, I dare, dare I say it, everybody is an artist or potentially an artist or has the potential to become an artist or is, as it were, given an environment where they can have a creative, be, be creative above all. But this is a big illusion that everybody can be an artist. It's not true. People do different professions. And, you know, I always say the, the same, same old story. If you make the bread in the bakery, you're a baker. If you make bread in the gallery, you're an artist. So the context makes the difference. That's all. Where you're doing what you're doing. If you're doing roller coaster, roller coaster, this is roller coaster. But if you put a roller coaster in a, in a, in a Tate, then you are Oliver Ellison. You know? So, so Just a different artist, different so name. So a great... A great a great doctor is not a great artist. No, it's not. It's not. You know, it's, it's this doctor. That's it. You know, you, you have to see the context where you are doing what you're doing. You know, I, I, you know, they say to me, why you don't do in monastery what you're doing, mom? Yeah, but I, I, I'm not in monastery. I am artist. My context is art. I'm working there. And the monk is doing things in, in the monastery. So that makes the difference where things are done. And your institute is an art institute? No, it's about culture. It's a totally well, that's a very, very subtle and interesting difference that I'd like to ask you about. When what's the difference between culture and art and the art gallery, you know, Sean Kelly's gallery or the Metropolitan Museum or the Museum of Modern Art and culture? Culture is much larger sense, you know. We know what this culture is. Culture is not just uh, selling art. <laughs> it's more than that. Can we ask other questions, please? <laughs> the question that comes up, do you have any regrets? What would you like to do again? You know, I really don't have regrets. I really do whatever I want. That's, you know, the sense of freedom, it's incredible when you understand that actually you, you all of us can do whatever they want. You just have to get to that state of mind. You know, I, I, I think that things was difficult, that I, I had the hell of the life. I had the times when I didn't have money. I live in the car. I had a horrible childhood. I mean, name it. But where I am now, I worth every single minute what happened behind me, because that brings me and here. Is that something Without will, we will not be any But of is this. that something you can do specifically through art? Yeah, but I used to be. I used to choose to be art. I never doubt to be anything else. I was so jealous of Mozart because he did uh, his first uh, concert with seven. I done my first show with twelve. It was a little late, but you know. So where can, where can, we, can I choose one question yeah, from there? Yeah, you choose a question. You choose a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> These questions, wait. And you know, homage to John Cage. Close your eyes and pick up the question. Very good. Not choose anything. Okay. So what is your relationship with your own body? Oh. Wow, life and hate. La <laughs> love and hate. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting. When I perform, I don't care how my body looks like, because my body is my tool. I don't feel, I don't care if it's old, I don't feel if I'm fat, if I'm skinny, if I am this or I'm that. But in my own life, I'm very conscious about my body. I always think, oh my God, I eat too much, I have to stop eating chocolate in the night, I have to do this, I have to do that. So it's a complete contradiction. And one thing about my life is that I learn to expose my contradiction to everybody, because we all like this. 
is I don't want to present myself like a you know holy monk, which I'm not. I have all different contradictions, and one is about relation to my body. Okay, next. What is this? Oh, this is what sort of emotions we are going through to your mind when you saw your ex-lover for the first time in years during your exhibition in MoMA. Have you spoken to him since? Ah. Again, 24 years old story. All right, so first of all, I invite Ula as a guest of honor to come to MoMA because the big part of the show was about our relationship. So he came there with his, uh, the, you know, the future wife. And, uh, and I knew he's coming, I say hello to him, it's fine. But when he sit in the front of me in that moment, that was different. He was not one of the public. I spent life with him, so that was a very emotional moment for both of us. Next. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing the faces of thousands of strangers in your MoMA exhibit, is any stands out of your memory and why? Oh my God. Not, not, not just one. You have no idea how emotional this was. Because, you know, I have in this exhibition about 72 people who came more than 21 times to sit with me, who wait hundreds of hours to do that. And they come from different social backgrounds. They come from different professions. Some of them just came first time to MoMA and they, just as a tourist. And that experience unified them together. So they are sometimes, you know, every two or three months they get together and have a dinner. And they, and they talked between each other and I met them. And these faces are engraved in my head forever. The most touching thing for me was also that in MoMA there is 86 guards who guard museum. You know, the guard, the, 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 the work there. And these people will go home and come on the, during the, the, the non-working hours without uniform and wait to, and to sit with me to have this experience. That was very touching to me. So they may have even waited for six hours and more. Yeah, I mean... That Which is, is a kind of action in itself. So that was just not normal. So uh, that's a very mysterious one. Try to guess who wrote this. <laughs> I keep this one. Maybe it will revile from me. I don't know. So they can identify themselves. As later. an artist and teacher, what do you feel you proud for the public and what you what to provide for the public and the and the students is the main objects to you to focus, to provoke an action or change of throws in the viewer. No, you see, it's not about provoke auction or anything. It's just uh, really to connect. The idea of performance is to connect, to, to really connect to the person. And this is why for me now performance is more important if it's one-to-one. -one. And then another step is that the person in audience connect with himself is even more important to connect with me or anybody else performing. That's what is missing. Because we always read the book from somebody else's experience. But we have to which we have to learn that is us who will have to go through experience. We, the public can't be just anymore some kind of a, a voyeur of things happening to somebody else. They have to take active participation. And this is why Institute is doing that. You see, this but is... Can I interrupt, Marina? Maybe. <laughs> yes. Marina, so what is the difference between a poem, a painting, going to the theatre, listening to music on the one hand, and performance are all the, are they theoretical? Is it all about level? Is it about intensity, or is it basically potentially the same in its transformative potential? It's absolutely the same. It's just a different form of arts, and and every every this form of art can be brilliant and incredible and 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 moving. The theater can be the great piece of theater, the great of the piece thing, of music. You know, and this, one of I'm the things one of the things you talk about. Sorry, before you finish that, you talk about the preservation of performance art, which is by its nature, ephemeral, like the theatre. So uh, do you think it'll be possible in a hundred years' time for somebody, a man or a woman, to do your performances again in their own way based on a kind of notation or record? But it's doing already now, and, and absolutely it's possible. This is the whole idea. The performances are just a script, and anybody can do it any time. And I think it's very important to be done. And it's very important the performance is living form of art and not just this kind of stupid image in the book, forgotten. 
have to live all the time. And even if this other person brings his own charisma, and even if this other person brings his own, you know, personality and change, still is better than not being performed. So that and it's very difficult for ego for an artist to, to just let it go. And that's important. Well, a musician would not. I mean, as to say, a composer, whether it's John Cage, who is still performable today, or Mozart, or whoever, or, or Wagner. But it's always done in a new way, and it still can live again and does live. Yeah, but this is and the music, this is theater, this is dance. Had the different rules from the right from the beginning. Performance never had this kind of rules. It was always related to be original, just one to one person, only one artist. It was different rules. Now we are breaking these rules. Okay, next. Can bad and good art be different? Yes. Good art. How do you get inspired? Oh, no, how you get insp inspired? I never get inspired from another artist because artists always get inspired from somebody else. That means you're inspired from second hand, and this is not good. I'm inspired from nature, the, anything in nature, the places of power, this kind of trips like I've done in Brazil, going to desert, sitting in the, in, 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 at the waterfall. And that's, everything comes from there. Everything comes from there. The, 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 the you know, inspiration has to come as a vision. Do you I have moments of doubt, Marina? Do you have moments of doubt or you have blockages. Of course, and in the beginning when I was young, I had these horrible blockages and I was thinking, oh my God, now deal with the questions. I come back in five minutes. Would anybody like, would anybody? <laughs> She's the most wonderful girl, one most wonderful woman. Now, does anybody in the audience like to ask any additional questions for me? Either write them down or come and address them directly to her. We have a little interval, and we'll have another 15 minutes, and then we'll call it an evening, I hope, unless you want to go on. Hmm? But Marina is an extraordinary personality who's been a very transforming artist, I'm sure we all agree. Uh, in the way that, in, for me, Joseph Boyce, in his way, whatever she says, was also a very transforming person. And I think one of the big questions is the, the, the cult of personality, I think was another thing that we could perhaps ask her about. To what extent the name, Marina, you've done, thank you for coming back. There we are, I'm talking a little bit, here you are. Here's your, yeah, please, ask her a question. How is my art different from religion? So that's the question. First, I don't like religion, because religion to me is an institution. I am not interested in religion per se, I'm interested in spirituality. And I think that my art has components of spirituality, and which I practice, that's all I can say. But it's not religion. But you don't want to have MAIs in every city of the world or in every town? You wouldn't like that. Would that be a horror? Yeah, no. You always ask strange questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good question, one I'd written down myself, actually. How you did you arrive at the six-hour number for the Institute? Why six hours? Why not ten hours? Why not seven hours? You know, I, I really was kind of experimenting with long-duration things, and for the average people, six hours is long enough. Seven is, like, too much, you know? And this is how I was thinking. But also six, six days, uh, you know, I, I like that idea of six six days, six hours. Did you know Morton Feldman? Do you know his piece for Philip Guston, which goes on for six hours, Marina? No. Beautiful piece of music, which goes on forever, and beautifully, beautiful it is. And we had it once at the Royal Academy in the middle of a Philip Guston exhibition. No, I'm going to learn. The piano, but, flute, and percussion. But wait, this is an interesting question. No, I, you have to write this down and look. If you had one activity to recommend in order to create self-consciousness and self-awareness, what move, what will be? Why do you think you have to break conventions in order to be an artist? Uh, I don't know. I don't need to break any conventions. I, I just think that, uh, that uh, I'm just uh, kind of claiming the freedom to do things that I think is beneficial to others. But what I think, one great exercise I'm recommending to everybody, it's so simple. You go to supermarket and you buy one pound of rice and you buy one pound of black sesame seeds. One you pound of? Black sesame seeds and uh, one pound of white seeds. rice. No brown rice, just white rice. Then you go to your home in, and you find simple wooden clean table, not to be disturbed, 
put your telephone off, and you take one and you take piece of paper and pencil. So you take rice and sesame seeds and you mix it in one, you know, just one mass. Then you spend the day dividing black sesame seed, white rice, and then you start counting sesame seed and rice and writing a wonderful exercise. It takes maybe 48 hours. <laughs> but your mind is clean as a glass of water. Kind of question over from the lady here. Wow, <laughs> that's, you know, my, my advice is always, you know, to the point, if you really, first of all, if, you re if you're really an artist, you have to be diseased, you have to have a, some kind of fever, you have to know that you can't do anything else but, you know, be an artist, and then you have to really have something to say, and if you have all these elements, you have to be ready to sacrifice everything you have mostly your private life, mostly your family, and everything else for your work. And that's a very lonely life. And if you're ready to do this, you may succeed. It's a hard work. OK, so oh, this I answer all. Wait. <laughs> Let's see. This is getting interesting. Are you open to collaboration with artists? Yes, that's the whole thing. The, you know, the my is not is not to, is is for artists. It's for scientists, for the people with the new ideas, think new thinkers. That's exactly what it's for. And it's the moment we open it, we would like to you know first to to have as young artists as possible. But only the one restriction we have in this institute that the projects in any category have to be long durational. That's the, because we, I believe in long durational form of art as the, the only and the most intense changing of consciousness. So that's the only actually the thing that have to be long durational. Anything six hours or more. Would you like to set up your little, your, your, your temporary structure in Central Park Marina? It, we can do in London. We, we can do it in London too. Yeah. I, I in just, Hyde Park. Hmm? That's perfect. I'll try and set that up. Hmm? I, that's what we're going to do. Ah, how you do identify bad art? Well, that's a great question. Okay. How you know something is bad? Ooh, I think you know immediately. You kind of get, <laughs> it really annoys you. You, you, get, get, you get kind of bad feeling. You can get even the rush or, the, or itching, or you can have strange cramps in your stomach, or you're really bored to death. I mean, you know, bad art is easy. How you, you know what is bad art immediately? Yeah, you recognize it when you see it, like you recognize good art when you see it. It's very difficult. You know yourself. But it's based on a kind of experience, isn't it, Marina? Yeah, it's, it's Somehow. true. Somehow. Yes, you have to know. What are your truths on the power and use of hypnosis? You know, I made one work with hypnosis a long time ago in the early 80s. It was a very interesting experience. I was, I was with Ulai, and we decided to actually get hypnotized regularly, three times a week for one month, and by the really famous doctor in those times in, in Amsterdam. And the idea of this was that he asked us only about work we have in our mind under hypnosis, not anything about past life and all this stuff, just about work. And we record this without listening. And we rec after one month, three months actually, we done three months. After three months, we listened the recordings. And because we wanted to go directly to subconsciousness without passing through the consciousness to get really true ideas. And we actually have a five works developed out of that images that we got under hypnosis. It was impor a really important experience. I'm, it's kind of interesting. What more questions about? I have to just tell you about the long questions, one wonderful story. There, we was in Germany. The Dalai Lama gave this uh, very beautiful speech, and uh, there was a question and answer section. And there they came the German guy, who was probably a philosopher, and he asked the question, who was like at least half an hour long. And he was so intelligent and so incredibly educated and with so many references. And after this question, was asked, Dalai Lama looked at him and he said, I'm so sorry, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> so, Wait, so, so maybe he said yes. <laughs> so what I want to say, let's keep short questions. There are some very long ones. 
You have to make it one line question. <laughs> Come on, you have a question. Okay. Come on, ask one. What do you regret I said? You know, I'm really, I don't know why I'm so crazy about volcanoes, but I love to be to look volcanoes. This is one of my favorite places. It is something to do with eruption and, and just the idea that entire Earth, we are sitting on this fire, you know, but you never really kind of consciousness of seeing how it's exploding and releasing out of the, of the middle of the, of, the, of the planet. And to me, I really love that. There is something there that I forget the world, just sitting on. You know, I, I used to uh, stay in Stromboli, it's in the, in the next to Naples in Italy, and this is one of the l only living volcano in uh, in Europe who actually explode every three to four minutes all the time. And if it doesn't explode more than fifteen minutes, every got to worry because that may be going to you walk on black kind of sand. It's yeah, it's you amazing. You walk on black sand. I've uh, been there myself. There's hmm? even a movie made Stromboli with Rossellini, but that was quite interesting. And just to be there, it was it was like you're living. You really have sense of planet that you're living on this, on this source. Okay. Do you have a long time? Uh, do you have a long time? So what do you do? I have no no time at all. That's the ridiculous. How you know? In my life, I literally don't have no time. But that's why I'm taking long time in my work. So it works perfectly. I wake up six in the morning. I work like hell. Are you in a Honestly, hurry? I am, yeah, it's like no time left. And, that, and and you know, especially in Europe, I think everybody don't have time. So what is your strategy for getting this off the ground, Marina? Tell to, me. To get what? To, to get the 20 million pounds, the 20 million dollars, I beg your pardon, to make this okay. possible. Can we put the, please, the, our Twitter, the Facebook, and all other strange stuff on the, on the scene? Where is the, where is the, okay. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, what is my strategy? Uh, all right. I have Siena. This is a new generation of the of the people who work to be, to work at this institute. And she will tell you all about Siena. Please come and tell them all about, because I don't even know who works Facebook. Hi. So I'm Sienna, right here. Um, so I run social media for the Institute, and we're really trying to create engagement at this early stage, trying to create the Institute in existence before the physical building exists. Um, and we're doing this through these digital tools, through the social media tools, creating conversations, talking to the public, educating people about long durational works. Um, and basically, we, we are trying to create a, a, a group of a supporters of this project um, and, and institute certain programming before the institute actually exists in a physical building. Um, and so we will be next month launching a crowdfunding campaign. Um, we're really going to be trying to open our arms to the public um, and ask for small donations as opposed to going directly to larger donors. Um, we really want to create this sense that um, the world wants this place to happen, and um, that we have the support of the general public um, to create the institute um, in a physical location. And some want to work for you, I see. There are Sorry? lots of volunteers. Dear, dear Marina, I'd love to volunteer to help I told you. I. How can <laughs> I do that? Thank you. Please give them your name and Okay, so email me. Uh, my, my email address is sienna at mai-hudson.org. Um, we're really open. I mean, I'm always on there just talking to people in the public um, about how they can get involved and collaborate with us on a number of different programs and projects. Um, and I'm also always on the Facebook checking uh, and the Twitter. Marina said that I'm the first person who should do this cleaning the house workshop because <laughs> I'm always looking at the social media tools. Um, but really, that's necessary for this Marina, part. How long and someday do you want to go I'll have on that for? chance. Six hours? How long do you want to go on for? How long do you want to go on for now? Marina, I want you to bring you. I, I want you to decide when we've had an, when you've had enough. <laughs> that could be a long time, but we have to have pity. <laughs> we have to be pity for the. So I really think we because the, I was looking at the other questions mostly is about how to help young artists. There is one question I like to answer. Probably the last will be, what is advice to artists who perform the first time? That's a really beautiful question and. Uh, touch my heart because I know what means, you know, performance artists and I know what means how to, you know, when you do the first time. I remember, you know, my time when it was happening to me, I was so nervous, I was dying. I was basically spending most of the time in the bathroom, you know, I was like hiding from everything. But what is really important, it's, um, 
at that moment when you step from you, um, your personal self into your super self, into the, the, the person you're going to be in the form of the, when you're performing. And uh, you really have to take courage and uh, just put the fear aside, that's important. And even if your performance is not the best one, the first one, even if it's not, uh, if it's not you know, the best piece you've ever made in your life, you go and do it. And also, just don't be afraid of failure. Embrace the failure. From failure, you can learn so much. But if you don't risk, and if you don't experiment, and you don't try new things, you will never be anywhere. So just go and do it. Thank Marina, you. Marina, you're a super person. Thank you so much. Thank you.